Hello, I'm Alex Heath. Tonight we have a special show. We will look into the life of graduate students. I'll have two guests, both current graduate students, one going into the area of public health, another into geoscience. My third and final guest was a recent graduate in the area of sports management and recreation. He is a, also a current instructor here at WKU. Coming up on the show, we'll have the three guests. We'll see exactly what those rewards and challenges they faced in going through their process of going to graduate school. Hello again, welcome back. I'm here with Lenita Glass, uh, my first guest on the show tonight, and she's getting her degree in public health education. We can all know how important health is to anyone in any community, and it's a big deal going on with health care and uh, the Obama administration right now, how that's changed in recent years. So, Lena, thank you for coming on the show today, thank you first having. of all. Um, and what does your work exactly entail in your graduate work? Um, it involves a wide variety of um, uh, course work um, involving public health. Um, we, um, our core uh, content is biostats, um, health behavior, um, environmental health, um, epidemiology, and uh, public health administration. Now, I also noticed in when um, talking you know, via email that you said that a lot of your work is tied to uh, restaurant inspection. Yes. And this is one of the biggest restaurant you know, cities in not only in this state and the area, but in the country. Yes. So how important is that you know, impact for wise in this area? Um, it's very important. Uh, we have to ensure that when we go out to eat that the food is prepared in a safe manner. And um, so that is very important to public health. And uh, my capstone project focuses on restaurant inspection scores. Um, and the impact on the uh, um, ability of restaurants to stay open. Mm. Um, now, why did you choose to go with uh, not necessarily just, not only just public health, because you know, a, lot of, a lot of people go into you know, the health areas, but the focus on restaurant inspection? Um, actually, um, the Barron River District Health Department was looking for a graduate student to work on some data, and so that sparked my interest in working on that. Okay. Um, you know, with, with public health, like I said, you know, the Obama administration has been a big, a big deal. With, he's changed how health care has worked out. Has that affected you know, your in, you know, in, interest in going into this? Did the change in health care affect your um, interest in going into public yes, health? Yes, um, with Obamacare, um, another focus that I work on is work site employee health. And so um, since insurance premiums are going up, mm -hmm. um, we are looking for ways to cut down on those premiums. Right. And so a lot of our work that we do in work site wellness helps to lower those premiums. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, you're here doing work at WKU. Why did you choose WKU? Um, they have wonderful benefits at WKU. So while I've been able to work here, I've also been able to get my education. Okay. Um, you know, this has been this, this campus is you know not the most popular as far as like you know UK and U of L are the two most popular schools in this country. A lot of people know them more. You know, but this campus is beautiful. It's sitting in a you know a very serene. Um, you know, geography with the unique a aspect of caves that I'll talk about later on the show. And so it's, it's a very unique um, area and a very unique campus. Um, is it something that drove you here? Was that, you know, just how, how beautiful the campus is? is something Absolutely. About it Absolutely. And I've, I've actually been here since 97 and I've, I've seen it evolve into something really nice and I'm glad to be a part of Western and working here and being a student here. Um, now, you know, so work in public health is um, it's, it's so important because healthcare affects everyone. You can some you know some industries can only affect some people, right. but healthcare definitely affects everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have did you have someone growing up that you looked to and said, hey, this person really drove me to go into healthcare? Yes, uh, my mom. Um, she was a nurse, and so um, that I didn't want to be a nurse, but I wanted to do something with the public health, and I came to Western and found um, the major in public health, and so I was able to to use that. Uh, you know, we all had, so like this is your mom is uh, important to you. And I said a lot of people, I think important for families, if you stay strong with your family growing up, it usually has a big impact on what you, what you choose to do. Um, so my family is always like, oh, you talk too much. You need to be on, on television. Here I am. But, um, you know, with another thing with, with health, you know, it's, you have to be able to talk to people and be able to relate to people because it's hard because you have to break a lot of bad news dealing with people that are sick and they find out they had some kind of terminal illness. You know, I mean, how, how important is that for you? Is that something you had to work on a lot just to get? Yes. Um, with, with public health, though, you kind of get to share some good news. You kind of get to right. um, talk about some good, healthy habits and get people on the right track that way. So you can kind of turn it around and make it positive. Yeah, um, there's been a big deal going on in this country with uh, obesity, and um, so you have to, like you talk about, giving people healthy habits and ways to keep, their, you know, their health and keep, you know, like exercising and eating right. Um, 
How big of a challenge is that, you know, so for not just for you personally, because you have to practice what you, what you Absolutely. preach. Exactly. Absolutely. You do have to have that image, um, mm -hmm. because if, if you're talking to people about, for example, obesity, and you, you don't exercise or appear to look fit, then people mm -hmm. are not going to take you seriously. So it is a challenge. Absolutely, because um, you have the issue with like I said, new people have a new year, new, year, new year's resolutions. They'll be like, okay, I'm going to lose you know, so much weight this year, and then you know, it always lasts like a week. So people are like, oh, I, I was like, oh, I guess I'll try again next year, kind of thing. But um, you know, so you got um, you know, pub public health is always important to, to communities. And um, I mean, what, have you done a lot of work in with with this community? As you mentioned the Barron River Health Department. Mm -hmm. What all have you done with them? Um, now, you know, years ago I did work with them, and so at that when I worked for them, I was able to do, uh, you know, breastfeeding is important. So it's um, that I did a campaign with them for that. Um, and this summer I'll be doing, this is all from Bear River District Health Department, but I'll be working with CHC Employee Health and Wellness and I'll be able to participate in some programs that will help the community there this summer. What type of programs do they offer? Um, we're going to focus on work site wellness. Mm -hmm. So we, they go out in the community, CHC goes out to the communities or employers to see if they want to start up employee wellness programs. Okay. Um, and I actually saw that also was going to, you mentioned it, uh, was employee well, wellness programs that uh, some companies have implemented those and try to push their employees to, as they feel like, you know, if they're healthier, they'll be happier and they'll work better. And do you see that being a correlation? Yes, I, it's, um, that actually field is going to be growing. Um, public health, um, health coaches, that's going to be the growing um, field. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, here in this this community, said so with all of the the restaurant options and the places that are going on, so the you know, health inspections and the food inspections of, and restaurants are, are important. Like you said, um, but what all goes into a health inspection? For people that attend all these restaurants that may not necessarily know what goes into those inspections. Okay, a restaurant has to be inspected at least once every six months. Um, and the sanitarians that go in, they use an inspection sheet and they check various um, t time and temperature. Um, uh, facilities establishment to make sure it's in working order and then they get a score and um, that's, that's it pretty much. Um, and have you done any of these? I've been a part of any of these uh, health inspections here I in Bowling. I did do a ride along, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what did you witness? I mean, I don't necessarily know the name of the restaurant, mm -hmm. but like, what, I mean, what was the issues they looked at? Um, they make sure there's no dents in the cans. Um, they make sure that they, they have thermometers and they make sure the refrigerators are where they're supposed to be. Um, and they make sure the lighting fixtures are good. I mean, they, they do a thorough inspection. Um. You know, what was the biggest thing that you know, maybe surprised you when you went on this ride along that said, hey, I wasn't really sure how, how much in detail they went on this? Um, I really didn't know they went into much detail in this structure of the building as far as lighting, mm -hmm. um, holes in the walls, uh, flooring and that kind of thing. I didn't know it was going to involve all that. Uh, now, so you mentioned they said your mom drove you into doing this. Um, you, what, what did you actually get your undergrad degree in? Public health. It was public health. So you've just kind of stepped along in doing this. And what is your favorite part about what you're doing in public health? Um, all of it. It's all really fun. And the, the most um, important part of it is that you can choose whatever you want to do, whether you want to work with younger kids, you want to work with older adults, uh, work site wellness, um, sanitation. Uh, it, there's just a lot of things you can do with public health. Right, so you, you mentioned uh, the starting with little kids and how important is it for uh, parents to start raising their kids right on healthy habits? It's very important. If you can start earlier, the better off they are. So we've got uh, about, about a minute left in uh, this part of the show. Um, if you wanted to say you know, a little something like to put toward parents to the community about living right and how important it is for healthy habits, what would you tell them? Um, that to, to, just the very basic information, just exercise daily at least 30 minutes a day, uh, eat plenty of fruits and vegetables. Um, and um, that's about it. That's about it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you for coming on the show today. I'm sure everybody that's seen has learned a lot about public health and people about the restaurant inspection because I didn't know what all goes into restaurant inspection. So it was interesting to learn. Uh, thank you for being on the show today. And uh, after uh, we, we'll come back, we'll have uh, Gil Olette who will talk about geoscience and water conservation in caves. Hello and welcome back to the second part of my show. Uh, we, today we have uh, Gil Olette. We'll talk and uh, getting a degree in geoscience and doing some interesting work with uh, water resource management in the Caribbean. Not in this area, but in the Caribbean. So you've got to stretch out a little bit to get to some of your graduate work. A little bit. It's a bit of a trip to some of my field sites, um, but a nice trip. But a nice trip. When you get the Caribbean, you have to deal with the cold weather we've been dealing with uh, some recently here. Oh, it, it's quite nice for the most part. Um, well, you know, back to the just the original, you know, geoscience. Explain to me what geoscience is exactly. Well, geoscience is uh, an interesting field. Uh, it's quite broad. Um, so 
most of the earth sciences or different studies of the earth sort of fall under that category. These include fields like meteorology, things like geology, um, and other sciences that most people don't think about as often, geophysics, um, paleontology, studying fossils, and pretty much all of the different aspects of the earth that we can study physically. Okay, that, that clears it up a little bit. Um, now, you personally, I said, I've you know, met you through Dr. Polk in the geology department and actually had you as a graduate student in one of my classes, uh, which was, I found kind of interesting. But um, you know, why go into geoscience? Why geology? Well, for me, it was easy. Um, it's something I've always been passionate about. Um, but for most folks, it's practical. Um, a lot of people don't think about it um, because the earth is under our feet. We don't often look down and think about what's going on. Um, of course, it's important for us because that's where we get a lot of things we rely on, between resources like petroleum, fossil fuels, and water as well. So there's certainly a great deal of practicality to studying the Earth and how we can use it to our benefit. I said, there's, and there's no place to me in, in the world that is more connected to, you know, its underground ge and geography and environment than right here in this area. Absolutely. Uh, Bowling Green was once hailed as a city with remarkable natural sewage of course, being the cave systems that it's built on. Um, I think we've learned a bit, a little bit more since we used the All caves right. as sewers. I hope so. But um, it's still a lot of work to be done, and a lot of folks still don't understand in full how those caves impact our daily lives. Um, uh, on, on your individual work, you said in working in you know, water resource management in the Caribbean, you care to elaborate exactly what you're doing? Well, absolutely. Work? I kind of take a roundabout way of looking at water resources. Um, so down on the island of Barbados, uh, where I'm doing my thesis work, um, I work with some of the, uh, the government groups who run sort of tourist caves and different attractions. Um, they're also on a karst landscape like us, so they have a lot of caves, sinkholes, those types of features. Um, and of course, they have water issues. Um, as an island, it's a little bit trickier than here. If your aquifer on an island runs out, that's pretty much it. You can't get any more water from upstream um, you really have to ship it in or uh, desalinize it. Um, so down there, they're really interested in keeping what they have and making sure it stays pollution-free and usable. And so what I do is I go into caves and I take um, samples of cave um, sediments, things like stalagmites, and I use those to look at how rainfall patterns and water has changed over time on the islands. And using that, you can see under these conditions in the past, this is how their water levels have changed, and that helps you sort of plan for the future. You know then, you know, under certain climate conditions, what you can expect in terms of water resources. So it helps them plan, ahead, plan for the future. It's like, there's, here's just how the tree and how things have been going. Here's what we can kind of expect, you know, coming up. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, how, why, you, know, you decided to go into you know, geoscience and geology. You know, what was the biggest challenge when you stepped into graduate school? Like, I didn't really expect this to be, you know, as hard or... Well, it's a, it's a unique thing moving from an undergraduate curriculum into the, the graduate studies in a science field. Um, as an undergrad student, mostly, you show up to classes, take tests, you sort of memorize all these equations and all this knowledge. Uh, once you're a grad student, you're expected to no longer just memorize, you have to apply it and make new science. Um, so that's really interesting. You sort of get put out in the field and it's like, well, figure out something to do and make it worthwhile. And figure out something to do and make it worthwhile. Need to write that one down. Uh, you know, with, you know, with this community you know, being so connected to caves, something else people don't really realize is the number of endangered species that are co solely connected to cave environments. Absolutely. There are a lot of species that adapt fully in cave environments. Um, and there is a remarkable amount of biodiversity in caves that unless you've spent time in there, nobody really sees. And of course, if we do things like pollute our groundwater, um, it makes it a lot harder for some of those species to survive in those sensitive environments. And so it's important in the fact that a lot of us like endangered species, we want to keep them around um, from the biodiversity aspect, but it's also important for us and for maintaining an ecological balance so we can continue to have valuable water resources, valuable cave resources. A lot of places, Bowling Green included, especially if we look up at Mammoth Cave, um, just 45 minutes from here, they rely on these cave ecosystems for revenue to bring money into the community. Um, and to keep them as important natural sites of heritage. Uh, there's one, one of the you know, highest things on the known list for Kentucky is Mammoth Cave. I said that in the Kentucky Derby are probably one, two. For people that know anything about Kentucky know it's, that's here. Yep. 
uh, draws a lot of you know a lot of tourists, a lot of people, because there's not a whole lot else in that you know in that area besides just Mammoth Cave. It's what draws all its revenue into that community. Absolutely. Uh, now, you know, Bowling Green is really tied in. It has all of its water supply. A grand majority of it comes through the cave system. Can you explain to both me and and the, anybody viewing this to say that here's exactly how that works? Well, unfortunately, it's a little complex, but the long and short of it is. Uh, if you guys are familiar with the hydrologic cycle, it starts in the ocean. So we get rainfall that's formed from evaporation over the oceans or large lakes inland. And once it falls, uh, it'll fall in the watershed that Bowling Green's part of. And at that point, it's on the surface. And so if it's on, say, the surface of State Street, it picks up anything that's on the street as it moves downhill and down slope into, in our case, caves. Um, in some places where you don't have the karst geology, that, would, that water would have to percolate through soil and bedrock for many months. Here, it can flow right into our groundwater through Lost River Cave, uh, Carver Cave, some of the other caves right in Bowling Green. Uh, and so once it reaches those caves, it gets down into the groundwater. And then for us, we pull our water supply from the Barren River right down 31W. Uh, so a lot of folks will just think, oh, we get it from the surface stream. We don't have to worry about those caves. Um, but of course, some of these caves reach uh, that river right upstream of where we pull our water out of. So that whole system sort of starting from the clouds down is just water moving through the air down to the surface, picking up whatever we feel like leaving around and moving it right into our caves and then to our drinking water. Not only is, is Mammoth Cave close by, you know, so you mentioned, already mentioned Lost River Cave that's here in Bowling Green, and there's also Crump's Cave in Smith Grove that's actually owned by the university, where yep. a lot of, a lot of, you know, I know the work in the geology department is done. So what, you know, what work is being done by the ge geology department here in the Crump's Cave? Well, we do a lot. Uh, mostly we focus on how the chemistry of the water is changing. Um, from when it falls as rain, um, interacts with soil, things that might be in agricultural type land uses, uh, as well as what's coming off of the streets and roads. Um, and then we see how that's coming through in the cave. We can monitor you know, waterfalls in the cave to see how that water's changing. Um, we actually are lucky here. We have great water treatment thanks to our utility providers. Um, but it helps us understand, uh, especially for places or people who use well water, um, what's actually getting into that water supply to begin with. Right. Um, you know, Chicago actually recently had a sinkhole open up you know, when we I saw that, I was like, oh, that's more than we see here. Because the, recently there was a big hole that opened up, I believe, on Dishman Lane, and they had to feel like cars crashed down into it. And that's what people have to deal with. So how do, like, parking and transportation people, you know, you know, people that deal with transportation, how do they deal with that and build, make sure they build safe roads in this area? Well, it's tricky. Um, the easiest thing to do is um, get involved with your scientists. Um, for the civil engineers and the land managers, um, just come talk to some of the folks who are doing that kind of work. And you can do some things to try and help prevent that. Um, you can do some geophysical surveys. You can talk to cave mappers and cavers. They know where a lot of these caves are. And so if you interact with them, uh, you get a better idea of where caves that might be close to the surface are. And that way you can build your roads accordingly and hopefully not right on top of a cave that you mentioned Dishman. Of course, that fell into State Trooper Cave. Um, you can sort of at least try to maneuver these roads and infrastructure around these large voids underground. So just uh, one closing thing, if there were, what's the biggest reward you get out of doing graduate work? Um, well, as a scientist, I think the biggest reward uh, is talking to people, is sharing the science. Um, a lot of science and a lot of great science is done um, all over this country, uh, in this institution as well. But if it just sits and never gets out to the public, it's almost a wasted science. Okay. Well, Gil, once again, thank you for coming on to the show. I'm sure I, I've opened my eyes a little bit about you know, geology and how it affects this community. Good luck with your research, and once again, thank you for coming on. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, coming on, our last segment, we'll have uh, my only guest who is not a current graduate student, but a recent graduate student, and now a teacher here at WKU. We'll come after this. We will talk with James Cottrell. Uh, welcome back to the show. This is my, my third and final guest, Jimmy Cottrell, who is an instructor here at WKU in sports management and got his graduate degree here, even though he is not originally from this area, from way out west in Colorado. A little warmer here than where you're originally from. It is, yes. <laughs> they just got six inches of snow today, so yeah. yeah not, not regretting the, <laughs> the warmness. A little bit. I, I, like, I like the cold, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable right here right now. So you, got, you know, recently got your degree in sports management, uh, in sports recreation administration. Mm -hmm. um, what got you into going to sports recreation? Uh, luck, um, happenstance, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, 
I finished my bachelor's degree with history as a history major. Um, when I got out to Western Kentucky, um, I was interested in doing graduate work. I just didn't know what area to study. Um, going through the course catalog, I you know, came across, across sports management, and it was the um, first or second year they had actually opened up the Rec and Sport Administration Master's Program. Um, and uh, fit with my interests, you know, and, and some of my experiences being with, with athletics and growing up playing sports. Um, so kind of jumped in with both feet and it worked out all right. Well, I was actually backpedal into that, your athletic experience, because, you know, for anybody viewing this and you know, may or may not know, you know, your athletic past, what, what is your athletic experience? Uh, well, like you said, I'm uh, from Denver, Colorado. Uh, I attended New Mexico State University where I got my bachelor's degree uh, on a football scholarship. A four-year starter, I was all-conference a couple times, all-American, and then I uh, signed as a free agent. I wasn't drafted. I signed as a free agent with the Baltimore Ravens, uh, similar to what Bobby Rainey um, is in now. Um, spent two years with the Ravens, backing up Ray Lewis, and then a year over playing in Germany in NFL Europe. The last year that league was in existence. Got hurt. Um, had to go back to school because when I was a student athlete, I was a classic underachiever. Um, so I had to go back and finish school and kind of fell in love with it. You know, when I was playing, it was kind of a hassle. Um, but then when I was paying for it, I, I did enjoy it. And then, like I said, just circumstances ended up bringing me out to Bowling Green. And then, um, like I said, I was fortunate enough to find a program that kind of fit with those experiences. And in your graduate work, exactly, what did your graduate program, your degree, what did it entail for you to accomplish that? For the Rec and Sport Administration program, um, it's been growing. So they've recently opened up new concentrations in it. Um, when I was going through, athletic administration was the only concentration we had. Um, and for athletic administration, it is a practicum-based program. So some programs, graduate programs, will have you write a, or write a thesis you know, or do a capstone, um, like both of your previous guests had, had kind of had to go through. Ours is practicum-based. So it's really for practitioners who are working in the field, athletic administration, working for um, high school athletic departments, you know, working for conferences, um, state associations. Um, and so they, instead of actually making them do research and write you know, a thesis or produce a document, they have to go through and um, practically you know, exper practical experience, doing, doing something hands-on where you're organizing well, a championship right. event. Right. Um, and so for mine personally, I uh, helped out here with uh, KHSA, the um, State Football Gridiron Bowl Championships, mm -hmm. um, was the officials coordinator and um, KHSA hospitality coordinator. Um, and then I was doing a graduate assistantship with the Department of Kinesiology, Rec and Sport, which the master's program was under. Um, and so further, I, I did a couple other events, organizing a couple golf tournaments, you know, a charity fund, uh, fundraising bike ride um, for a nonprofit. Um, so they all kind of fell in line. And with the three of them, I felt three practical experience I, I felt was enough. Um, honestly, for just the program itself, as it requires just one, I don't know. I, I Personally, I don't think that's really enough right. to, to earn a master's. Um, I was fortunate, like I said, I was able to get multiple experiences, which mm -hmm. I felt prepared me and kind of right. I feel better about deserving the degree, right. having, having done so one. So instead of one major one, you did you know, right. three that were you know, shorter term that kind of you know, accumulated into what maybe would have been a bigger event right. kind of thing. Um, you know, on this campus, we definitely have some successful athletic programs from you know, football, basketball to volleyball team, mm -hmm. you know, who's been uberly successful, especially this past year. Um, you know, then, you know, there's the, what everybody sees is the player and the coaches. A lot of people don't know what all goes on behind the scenes besides just you know, recruiting and scheduling. Sure. So you know, give us the, you know, the gist as, as much of a small in the box thing you can uh, of what well, an administrative office has to go through. It's funny because the athletic department is kind of rarely, rarely seen or heard, heard about a lot. Um, like you said, the coaches and, and players tend to get the ink. Um, but you have a, a compliance department that is making sure that, you know, rules not only of the university, of the Sunbelt Conference, of the NCAA are being followed. Um, aside from that, you've got the uh, student athlete academic advisement, which is what I'm interested in, what I'm going to go pr produce, uh, pursue a PhD in. Um, they're actually doing, you know, the academic side for the athletes. You know, it's student athlete, so the coaches handle the athletic part. These uh, athletic administrators are handling getting the students, you know, through school, making sure they're make, making grades, you know, grade checks, things like that, making sure they're on track to graduate, helping them graduate, which, uh, again, Western has kind of had an exemplary record for, for graduating their student athletes, which is, which is very positive. Um, and then away from that becomes kind of the business aspect of it. And then your, you know, marketing, finance, accounting, um, development, um, fundraising is really big. Um, and so they're really just trying to generate revenue you know, as, as best they can. Um, and Western does a fairly good job of it. Um, we have a $22 million athletic budget, which is, which is good for the Sun Belt. We're gonna have to increase that, you know, when we move to Conference USA. Um, 
but we do borrow quite a bit from the university, so it's subsidized. That's gonna be a problem, or one thing that I think they have to address is kind of growing their own revenue streams, which again is part of the move, you know, in the Conference USA. Which, and you, you take me into my, <laughs> my next question. Um, you know, WK, you recently announced that move to Conference USA. How big a move is that, you know, for them, not just, just in sports, but, you know, just to get WKU's name out there more, sure. and just in, in general? Um, I think it's, I mean, it's a tremendous move for him. Todd Stewart has done a, a very good job since he's taken over, you know, as athletic director, and I think uh, he kind of has a vision for the program, and he's definitely moving in the right direction. Um, very good financially. Uh, we will, hands down, we're going to be making more money than we would have, you know, in, in the other conference. Um, again, the media exposure, and if nothing else, the perception. I mean, if you look at the teams that are actually moving into the conference USA with it's us, it's Sun Belt, Sun Belt 2.0, right. you know. Right. Um, but the fact that it's called something else, Conference USA, which has had, you know, a little bit of tradition and history behind it, has more bowl tie-ins, you know, more success, you know, in College World Series and baseball and mm -hmm. um, more tournament teams for basketball. Just that perception increases our, you know, our prestige with it. Um, so that, that's beneficial. Like I said, you can't be argued that it's a good move now. Um, the problem or the question because can, can we sustain that you know, within the next couple of years? Um, and again, we're gonna be making more money, but you gotta spend some to make money. Right. Spend, spend money to make money. So we're gonna have to up that athletic budget. How much more of that comes from the university? You know, and uh, are we opening up you know, more revenue streams through fundraising and media contracts that kind of supplements that so we're not taking so much out of you know, the um, university's coffers, you know, which financial freezes and tuition increases, you know, things like that. Um, so no, I think for the, in the near future, it's, there's not a negative thing about it. Um, great job, very promising for the university. It's just that question kind of, can there, there we, can we continue that, come up, that within, right? you know, four or five, six years down the road? Right. Um, one of the biggest documents printed in involving sports is Title IX, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Um, you know, what are the challenges that any school has to face when making sure they comply with Title IX? Um, well, that, that is kind of the, the challenge in intercollegiate athletics right now. Um, everybody's trying to get, you know, bigger slices of media contracts, which is driving all of this, you know, conference realignment. Um, the problem becomes you have to basically use two sports, men's football and men's basketball, to fund the rest of your athletic department. Now with that, and because of Title IX, the proportion of your student athletes has to match the proportion of your students on campus. Um, since 1972, since Title IX, the number of female students technically are now outnumbers male students. So if you have 55% female students on your campus, you need to have 55% student athletes you know, in your athletic department. Um, again, that becomes a problem when you look at football, having 85 scholarships, that's a big number that you have to match just yeah. in female participation alone. Um, on top of the fact that most of the men's sports and all of the female sports aren't revenue producers. They are dependent on basketball and football to generate enough revenue to cover their expenses. Um, that, that therein, I mean, that lies the problem. Because of Title IX, it's great, great law, um, probably the best and most influential law that's passed, piece of federal legislation that's been passed, you know, in, in the past century. Um, there's just some, some tweaks to it that need to be made because it does limit and kind of hamstring, you know, athletic departments budgets. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, maybe only 20 in a given year are actually profitable and making money, where the other, you know, 100 or so, FBS, you know, Division One college football um, schools are actually losing money, you know, if breaking even, if not losing money. I'm looking into your future a little bit, is you're going to pursue a doctorate degree. Some people will look and say, doctorate degree in sports, like how, how serious is that? I mean, I mean elaborate on what you're going into and why you want sure. to go into it. Um, I'm going to, into the uh, sport administration doctoral program at the University of Northern Colorado. Um, <laughs> what I want to do with it in kind of the end game and one of the thing, you know, kind of in conjunction with what, the, what, with what you're talking about is I, I want to teach, you know, in, a, in higher ed and that's kind of pretty much all you can do, you know, with a, with a PhD. Um, but more importantly than that, what I really want to play a role in is, is um, renovating, reconstructing the, the NCAA. Um, I think it's been obvious with some of the scandals that have come out, you know, throughout the history of the NCAA, but especially recently. Um, as well as kind of this conference realignment, the money grab, Title IX, all this kind of created a perfect storm that's proven that, you know, the system we have in place isn't working. You know, right. it, it's not equitable, it's not fair. Um, so it, instead of being hypocritical and saying, yeah, this is, this, this is working, this is the best interest of our university, you know, and our student athletes, um, I think we need to be honest and, you know, put together a new structure. Not that everything is bad with the NCAA, but it definitely needs to be, you know, renovated if nothing else, and that's 
really what I want to do with my research and um, with my doc doctorate is, is to play a you know, big role in creating a new intercollegiate athletic system. So it would be, definitely be helpful going toward the future, all the crazy cars well, that's going on. But James, once again, as your official name is James, Jimmy, thank you for coming on the show uh, today. I want to close by thanking, first of all, the station WKYU for uh, letting me do the show and use the facilities here. Thanking my wonderful crew for helping out today. Hope you all got enlightened by the show tonight, and thanks for watching.